off, I want to thank Pauline for hosting this. Um, these are a valuable part of the community here, and increasingly so. Um, and it's a delight to be here with you. Um, my name is Martin, and uh, today I'm going to be sharing five tools to help you create value in your life and business today. So uh, if, you, if you would, just save questions for the end, unless it's like really pressing, in which case, go ahead and interrupt me. But uh, I, I want to get all these ideas out, and then, then we can kind of process through them in real time. So uh, to start off, I want to tell a story. Um, NATO is very much, uh, NATO and Ukraine and the conflict in Europe is very much uh, in vogue in, in the news. And so um, back in 1983, November of 1983, NATO conducted a, uh, some exercises. They simulated a Soviet attack and they, they ran a whole bunch of sorties. They flew troops under radio silence from the United States over to Europe. They, um, they taxied aircraft out onto the runways in, in Germany and in the UK with simulated munitions, the whole nine yards. And the idea was, this is just an exercise. And what they, so it was a five-day exercise. What they didn't realize is that Soviet intelligence had picked up what they were, what they were doing. They were, the Soviet intelligence was starting to run surveillance flights, and they, they saw all this. And they started freaking out because this was a simulated attack on the Soviet Union in response to an attack, uh, a simulated or a supposed attack from the Soviet Union. And so the Soviets start freaking out and they start, they start building, they start their own operation. So Operation Able Archer happened and then the Soviets kicked off their own uh, operation called Operation Ryan. And fortunately, we, we learn about this years later, fortunately, the U.S. Uh, or the, the NATO intelligence chief in Europe had the presence of mind to see the, the Soviet response and actually de-escalated the situation. And he said, we're not going to mirror that escalated, that, that escalated threat. And years later, we now learned we came very close to a nuclear conflict in Europe, all because of a training exercise. It was all a big, gigantic misunderstanding. But the thing about misunderstandings is that misunderstandings can be significant. And one of the things that, that I think is, uh, is very common is the degree to which business is kind of complicated and complexified, and we think that it's this big thing that it's really not. And so today, I hope to clear up some, uh, some misunderstandings and maybe shine some light on areas uh, that are, are helpful to you. So, who am I? Uh, oh, there's the first slide. Things aren't often, uh, aren't always what they appear. So who am I? Uh, my name is Martin. I grew up in Africa. That's that big space right there. Um, it's actually the size of China, the United States, India, Western Europe, Germany, France. Yeah, UK. Um, it's a huge place. Uh, huge fan of uh, Chelsea, psychedelics, reading books, podcasts, YouTube videos. Um, been a few places in the world. Um, I was in the military, so I, I have an affection for firearms. Um, I like doing endurance events and playing soccer, and I love my family, my nephews, um, and my friends as well. And last but not least, I like building things. So um, when I, I, I attended college uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., and studied political theory. Not a whole lot of uh, political theory jobs when you get out of college, so I went down to Texas and uh, started working in oil and gas and uh, started working on uh, workover rigs. Saw a couple of my coworkers got injured, get injured, and so I figured it was a little dangerous for me. So uh, fortune has it that I was accepted into a management training program. And uh, three years later, uh, my team and I were managing about $56 million worth of annual revenue, about 54.7 million worth of uh, oil revenue and 1.5 million of, of gas revenue. Um, and on assets worth about $200 million. Um, and then uh, the next year, my company started a new department, new role, and I was tasked with building infrastructure. So stuff that looks like this. I was tax tasked with building the processing facilities for oil and gas. And so um, uh, my team in, uh, in, this, in a single year completed 106 projects, and we spent about $23 million. So we did all of that safely. Um, we built our own uh, SOPs, we built our own safety culture, um, and I'm tremendously proud of, uh, of what we did. So piggybacking off of that, um, I, I, uh, 
yeah, so I've, I've done a bunch of small business consulting, courtesy of the pandemic, I pivoted when that happened and, and wanted, to, wanted to help however I could. And so now I've been doing consulting, I've worked with the US military, worked with finance, um, small businesses, landscaping companies, interior design, a um, bunch of different things. So pretty varied. I'm really grateful to Eric for, uh, for his branding thing last week. Uh, I, I still need to do that because my, my customers are so varied. I need to, I need to clarify that. But anyway, um, so I'm going to be drawing from lessons learned. Yes, did you have a question? question? Yeah. How long did it take to take all the PhDs and talk? All the countries? It must be like a, like a lot of work. No, those are all emojis. Yeah. The Apple emojis. So I just... <laughs> anyway, yeah, go ahead. Where in Africa? Uh, Zambia and Kenya. I graduated from boarding school at Rift Valley Academy, if you're familiar with it, on the side of the Great Rift Valley. You said Africa is very big, but you didn't say where in Africa. Sorry, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a big place, and I've been all over it. So there's like Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Kenya, Ethiopia. There's a few of them there. So it's a big place, though. I recommend everyone go. So all right, let's launch into it so that you guys get something out of this. Um, what is a business? I, I want to start at kind of a high level and then we'll work our way down. So what is a business? Well, here's like the long sentence. It's an endeavor that exists to create value. I, I really want to key into that creation of value. But if you want to put it simply, a business exists to make money. That's, that's pretty much it. And a business is a living, breathing, organic thing. And it has, just like a body, it has a bunch of different parts. And so today I'm going to talk about operations, going to talk about finance, going to talk about technology, personnel, and leadership. So to start, let's, let's dive into operations. Or actually, before I do that, sometimes uh, it, it helps if I, if I have visuals. And so here's kind of a, what a breakdown of a, of a business looks like. Y you can do any schematic you want, but the point is, all of this complexity just needs to result in you making money. If you're not making money, you've got a problem. Um, so what are operations? Operations are the activity. Yes? I have one question about operations. I see your mic yeah. is turned to the wrong side. Thank you. OK. Appreciate it. How's that? Hopefully that works. All right. So what are operations? Operations are the activities by which we create value. And great business operations answer three basic questions. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And how much does it cost? And the reason why I put the cost component in here is because it's really important if you're going to be making value-based decisions, the people that are doing the operations and spending the money need to understand what, what, everything, what everything costs. So yeah, that's a key point. Regardless of whether we're freelance or part of a company, we want that value creation to drive our decisions. So, and, I, and if you ask questions about that, I'm happy to share some stories later. But so a tool for this is what's called cost-benefit analysis, or CBA. And a cost-benefit analysis is really simple. It's just an exercise where you, where you list out all of these things, direct benefits, indirect benefits, costs, opportunity costs, and intangibles, environmental factors. These, this is something that actually kind of relevant to the discussion that's going on in this community right now, because there's clearly some environmental costs that, uh, that, that people are, are, are talking about. And so this would go into, uh, into a cost-benefit analysis. So cost-benefit analysis is really helpful for short to medium term uh, projects. It's not, this is not gonna be for your, your entire company vision. This is for more focused efforts. So short to medium term projects and small to medium sized amounts of capital, that's super varied. For some, for some businesses, a small amount of capital is $500. For some businesses, a small amount of capital is $500,000. So it really, it really just varies. Uh oh, Sorry. you're fine. Hey. <laughs> All right, so here's, a, here's an example of a, of a cost benefit analysis. So just uh, cost, uh, here's the purchase of a new stamping machine, and it, clu it includes things like the cost, the increased revenue, the, well, how much it costs to train up the operator, utilities, square footage. This doesn't include some other things. It says square footage. Um, th this doesn't uh, include, for example, the effect that this would have on your operations. Like you want to list out those intangible benefits. Um, 
So this is, it's, it's just a simple example. So the next part of a business uh, is the technical side of the business. And the technical side answers the question, with what are we accomplishing or, or are we performing our operations? And the technical, it, we think of tech, and when we, when we think of tech, we think of cell phones, we think of computers, we think of printers, stuff like that. But it's actually literally anything that we use to create value. And so for some people, for example, Lotus, I see like you use the whiteboard over here. This is actually part of the technology for your business, and you're paying for, for access to this space. So this space is part of the technology that you're using to drive value for, for your business. So um, the, thing about, uh, the thing about technical stuff is invariably something's going to go wrong at some point in time. And so um, there's an engineering tool called root cause analysis. And root cause analysis is, is not just... What is, what is immediately wrong? You want to drill down and, and figure out what's the, what, what are all of the symptoms that you're seeing and what is their ultimate problem. So we had this all the time in oil and gas where uh, like, there would be something immediately, you would notice that the pressure is down on your vessel. Well, that's, that could be the root cause problem, but 99% of the time, that's not the issue. The issue is, is clearly something else further downstream. So you got to go through your entire facility and figure out, okay, pressure's down here. What is going on in the rest of this facility that's causing this to be going uh, to, to be low? So um, you want to dig down into your root cause. Um, and this is, a, this is a schematic. This is called a fish bones diagram for, for anybody that, that is big into like project management, stuff like that. Um, so all it was was a missed deadline. That's all it was. But then here are all, an assortment of symptoms or, or things that, that went wrong that caused you to miss the deadline over here. So these are actually the root causes of this one thing that's wrong. So you can, it, it's a pretty useful tool because it also, when you're, a, when you're a leader and you're going, hey, employee Joe Schmo, you missed a deadline over here. Well, how much have you done to ensure that that employee is, is going to be successful when you gave them that deadline, right? What, did you make sure that they were well equipped? Have you talked with them uh, about like their family situation? Did, is everything okay in their personal life? Like it, they could they could have wrecked their car on the way to work, <laughs> and of course they missed the deadline. And if you're just going to hammer them for missing the deadline, you're missing your opportunity to be a good leader um, and really engage with your employees. So. Um, yeah, so root cause analysis. This is something to help you uh, dig into technical issues. A third component of your business are the people. And really, this is the most important. I didn't put it first, but I probably should have. Um, the people are the most important uh, aspect of, of any business because it's the people that drive the creation of value. Nothing happens without, without the people doing, like creating it to begin with. And so the basic question is, who are we working with? And there's a, there's a number of tiers. It, it can get more complicated. You can include customers in here. You could include vendors. Um, but I just put three, three simple ones. So you have supervisors and authorities, people that you're going to need to work with that are, that are superior to you. And so if you want to interact with them and, and even guide them, you have to what's called manage up, if you're familiar with uh, uh, Jocko Willink's uh, work. Subordinates, that's your relationship with people that are underneath you that, that you're responsible for. And then there's peer-to-peer -peer relationships. And fortunately, none of us are really, uh, yeah, we're, we're all mostly peers in here. So uh, this is the most important part. I, I hope you take away is just how, how important people are to the, to the creation of value for, for a business. So, Martin, yes. Can you elaborate on managing up? Sure, yeah, so managing up. So, Let's just say that your leader does not have the full picture, which here's a, here's a shocking revelation. Welcome, welcome, come on in, come on in. I got the door. So the question was, the question was can you explain more about managing up? Um, so managing up is when someone is superior to you and they don't have the full picture, which shockingly, none of us have the full picture. There's always an aspect that we're missing. and so. Oftentimes, and, and I say oftentimes because it is the case, that oftentimes our leader doesn't have enough of, a, enough of an informed perspective to make the right decision. 
And so it's on us. If we're, if we're closer to the ground and we kind of know what's going on, it's, it's our responsibility to convey that information to the leader in such a way that that leader can now act on it, right? Can incorporate it. But so for example, let's just say that, let's just say your, your leader has missed a glaring, uh, you know, a glaring section of the, of the spreadsheet. And that, that section is going to meaningfully impact the economics of the project. Now, are you going to, in the middle of the meeting, go, hey boss, I can't believe you didn't read the spreadsheet before, before this meeting. There's that one section in, you know, starting at row H to Z. I can't believe you missed that. What, what's going on? That's gonna meaningful, is he gonna listen to you? No, he's, he's gonna tune you out. In fact, he's gonna rake you over the coals for being so disrespectful in the middle of the meeting. It, it may be much more helpful to, to either provide some sort of suggestion in the moment and say, I, I included this section, there's a section H through Z that I don't think we're considering at this time. Maybe, can we look at that? And then let him, let him or her come, come to the decision like, or come to the realization that, that they made a mistake and that they need to incorporate this new information. Or oftentimes, whenever there's authority in law, involved, you don't wanna undercut their authority in public. And so you wanna go to them in private and say, hey, actually, uh, there's a really important section of the spreadsheet that I didn't that, that you didn't mention and I really think it's going to impact the the project and if you do that they may actually have they may actually say actually I've already considered that I've already considered that and you you're missing X Y and Z sometimes that's the case but um, managing up so an informal tool um, so there's something called a pre-mortem. They use it in the military, they use it in Wall Street, they use it in, in big corporations. The, it's, it's like a formal meeting. I just do an informal pre-mortem and I just ask a simple question. When I'm, when I'm working with my, my supervisors, well, I, when we were doing construction, uh, when I was leading those teams, I had four supervisors that worked with me and those supervisors uh, were, had 18 employees under them. and so. I was constantly having meetings with my, super, uh, with my supervisors out in the field. And, and oftentimes, I would just ask this simple question. And I would make it personal, but you can, you can turn it in, into a collective as well. And just say, what are we missing here? And then go around and, and specifically, specifically, so it's, there's a presumption that the full picture is, uh, is missing. And then, I would invite contributions by name. I would say, hey, Jerome, what am I missing here? As I, when I give you this idea, what am I missing? I'm sure, I'm sure that I'm not seeing some particular thing. Can, can, you, can you explain more? And, uh, and, and go around the room. Marta, what am I missing here? And, uh, and so this, this helps to create a, a barrierless, non-hierarchical space, especially if the leader is vulnerable first. And, and offers the first potential pitfall. And I say, you know what? I think that there's a potential for that camera to fall over right now. That's a glitch, <laughs> that's a potential error in how we've set up this room. And then, then we can you know, have a constructive debate as to what's the best way to set up a, a recording for, for this space. But um, so invite contribution by name, not just whoever speaks the loudest. This, this is, there's often the case that there's a strong dominant personality in the group and they wanna give, they wanna give all, of the, all of the feedback. Well, Matilda may, may have something to say and she's, quiet, she's more quiet. So I'm gonna call on her specifically instead of yammering on because I've got a big loud voice. I'm gonna call on her specifically and say, hey, what am I missing here? What are we missing here? So the goal of this, uh, of this tool is just to, uh, it's to identify potential flaws in the plan and to reduce overconfidence. Because whenever you have a plan, you're 100% confident that that plan is gonna work, right? <laughs> Nobody has ever started a plan and gone, you know what, I think this is gonna fail. No, we all think that our plan is gonna work. So we want, so we want to, we want to, we want to create some potential negative feedback loops before the plan gets going so that we can think through this a, a little more critically. So that's yeah. Uh -huh. How do you differ your pre-mortems uh, between like your consulting clients mm -hmm. versus like just your project teams that are delivering the work? It's a good question. Differentiating them from consulting clients. Yeah, like would you add more steps to this, for example, if you're doing it for like a client or you know, less steps? 
Ah, uh, this is just something. It, it's not really formal. I, I haven't. I have never sat down. I've actually, if I can think about it, a I've never done. I've never done a formal premortem for a client. It's just something that, like, once you do a bunch of project management, it just becomes automatic. You're like, it, it's just basically how you end every every conversation. It's like, hey, what are we missing here? We we've had this really productive conversation. It's just gone on for 20 minutes, but. I'm sure that I'm missing something here. So is there anybody else or you can oh, go yeah, around? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I've done it for both. It's just, um, uh, it, it's more to like manage the expectations of the client by telling okay. them the risks up front so that they're not like, well, I, oh. I thought I was getting this and you said you, you promised me that. And right. The reality is because there's so many things that can go wrong, you don't want to promise anything up front. Yeah. You know, so it's a good thing to do. I mean, I Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, I think that managing expectations is a little different than this because managing expectations is more making sure that everyone understands what, what's going to happen. And this is more of a tool of let's assume that everything went wrong. What went wrong? Like the project failed. What do you think went wrong? And uh, yeah. So does that does that answer your question? Exactly. Yeah. And, and it has the presumption that We've we've messed something up. Like, and has anyone ever had a project that's gone perfectly to plan? Anyone? Yeah, I've never either. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, this is this is a really helpful tool for uh, for managing personnel. Um, and I want to include this. This is uh, we're talking about knowledge and what, what we know and when we know it. Um, so, I, I this is something that I've thought about. I call this the stoplight of knowledge. Um, green is go. So. There, there are four different categories. Green is go. Known knowns. This is conscious knowledge. So, you know, you know someone's name, or you, you're very, you're intimately familiar with how to operate the equipment, or your like factual information or yeah, technical information, proficiency. And then there's there's another category, and this doesn't get mentioned as much, interestingly, but it's the unknown knowns. And this is this is intuitive knowledge. And I say intuitive knowledge because. There is always a category of things that we know that we can't actually verbalize. And this is because actually part of our, uh, about two thirds of our brain is nonverbal, non-rational. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't know things. It's aware of patterns in the world. It's aware of, of sensations. But it's not able to specifically pinpoint it with the, with the, uh, the rational faculties from the, uh, oh my goodness from the uh, cerebral cortex, uh, cerebral cortex. So you still know things, and, and this should still be trusted. If it, um, combat veterans, for example, talk about, or this is, this is something that's really pertinent for combat veterans, because you'll be walking down the street on a patrol, and then all of a sudden your experienced guy goes, there's something wrong here. He can't, he can't point to exactly why, but there's just something in his intuition that says there's something wrong. And, and this is really, uh, when I say that this is, this is an area that we should trust, I really, I want to underscore this because your, our intuition is what keeps us alive and going and has the map of the, uh, of the space. And so we should really trust it. Even if, we, even if we can't specify it, we should work to specify it, but we should still trust these impulses. Um, so that's green. Green is go. Uh, yellow. This is known unknowns. So this is what I call the Google search. You know that you don't know something specific. Does that make sense? So you're aware that you don't know something specific. So I have no idea about the geography in Colombia. So I'm going to go and I'm going to research about the geography in Colombia, right? I know that I don't know something. So and this is this is a space that we're we're motivated to find the answer. Once we once we have identified something, we typically want to work and, and, and uh, overcome that ignorance. This is just a, a very normal thing. But it's also a space of creative tension. This is the space where if you hang out here, this is what going to school is. You, you, you hang out here, you go to school, you, you, you're taking on things that you don't understand, and you're working through it. And, that, and that's a tremendously creative and generative space. The last thing, and this is the red light, this is, we stop if we reach this space. Unknown unknowns. And this is where you don't know what you don't know. And this is the most dangerous thing. And this is why that premortem is so important. Because 
it's often the case that we don't know that there's other information out there that can help us, but, but we're completely unaware of it. And so the, the work is to try and move this category up into one of the other ones. So we want to we want to stay out of this one as much as we can, or and or like yeah get it move up move up the stoplight. So that's the that's the danger zone. So this is just a bonus. This is something that that I think about a lot. So uh, another component of business is the leadership component, and uh, the leadership it answers the question what does success look like, and then it directs action towards that end. So it's not just enough to to sit here in your ivory tower and think about what, what success looks like. That's not a leader. A leader is someone that's able to generate action based on that vision. So um, I, I really love this. Uh, this was the result of one of my Google searches. And I just love this picture. Um, so a tool that, that I was taught years ago and I continue to use to this day is it's super simple. It employs the, the common metaphor of a journey. And it's called the here, there path. And it's, it's pretty simple. So you ask three questions. You, says, you say, what is my current reality? That's an, that's an analysis of my present condition. I'm standing right here. This is how I'm attired. This is who's before me. These are the resources that I have. These are, this is what's behind me. This is what I'm trying to, this is actually, no, this, you're only focused on what you have in this immediate moment. And then the next question is, where do I want to be? Well, I want to be over here. Well, how do I, so, so you have to analyze that path, right? And then the final question is, how do I get there? And that's, that's where you analyze this path. But this is tremendously helpful. And the, interestingly, the thing that actually gets, gets people hung up the most is the current reality. It's their present moment that they get. Because people want to talk about, they want to talk about where they want to be all the time. I want to, I want to be a world, I, I want to be a world champion high rocks uh, competitor. That's, that's my thing. I love endurance things. I want to be a world champion high rocks competitor. I want to go to the world championship in Europe. But am I honest about what my current reality is? Am I training? Am I working hard to, to, uh, to overcome my current limitations? Well, not really, if I'm honest. And so I need to spend a lot more time in my, what is my current reality? What is my here? And I need to start working on that. And then, I need, and then from there, I'll get my path. I'll figure out, well, OK, I just need to talk to Jerome. And we need to sit down and put together a plan of how I'm going to become you know, a better endurance athlete with more power and able to handle the, the demands of, uh, of the competition. So, um, yeah, so this is tremendously helpful. I, I use this with myself. I use this with others. And it's so simple, especially in, in today's day and age where there's, uh, where people want to talk about leadership and they, and they make it super complex and you got to remember all these acronyms and you need to do this. And when you do your goals, you have to, they have to be smart goals and all <sighs> it's exhausting, right? It's super helpful to just think of, where am I at right now? Where am I trying to go? And how am I going to get there? And be honest with yourself in all of those, in all of those moments. And it's, it's tremendously helpful. So, all right. Now, last but not least, the money side. This is what a business is for, right? To create, to create value, aka money. Um, so I call this the show me the money. Um, so this is the, uh, a tool that I, that I use um, pretty frequently is the budget plus the postmortem. You, you can call it the after action review. You can call it a bunch of different things. But it's really simple. You create a financial analysis on the front end, create a budget, which is an estimation of revenue and expenses. I can read, thankfully. Um, and then on the back end of it, on the back end of the project, you want to do a postmortem or an after action review. And this is where you evaluate the, the project, the activity from a financial perspective. So how did we do? And the key thing is here, you have to have both. And what I, what I observe in businesses is they often have one or the other. 
when I'm working with clients. They'll often set a budget, but then they blow that budget out of the water and they never check it again, <laughs> right? Or alternatively, they do tons of analysis about their financial, uh, financial situation and they're like, well, our, our money's going here and we're spending this much on labor and oh my goodness, workers' compensation insurance has cost this much and oh, we, here's, here, I'm spending this much on soft drinks and client, client meetings and all this stuff. But they, haven't, they didn't set the budget at the beginning. And so this analysis is, is not really helping them because there's, they're not measuring themselves on any metrics at all. They're just kind of analyzing trends. Well, that's, that's of some use, but it's not of ultimate use. Yes? Yeah, I found actually a lot of people, they uh, come from a financial background or MBA. <coughs> they are steering too much their business with uh, Excel sheets instead of like following their intuition. Right. What is your perspective on this? <sighs> I mean, there's a reason why um, Amazon, for example, Amazon and Tesla both famously steered clear of MBA students for, for a long time. There's also a reason why Amazon then ended up, uh, has now ended up starting to hire those MBA students. I think that empowering someone with a ton of financial, uh, financial knowledge on the front end before you expose them to business operations results in, results in the kind of over uh, overconfidence that we, uh, that we have to mitigate for in the, um, in the pre-mortems, in the informal pre-mortems. The unfortunate thing is that also tends to come with a ton of confidence in, in your technical abilities, and that uh, undercuts the, uh, the humility that's necessary for, for a lot of these, uh, for the tool to work. So, I, I mean, you, you, the only way that your intuition is going to be informed is when you're exposed to patterns, when you engage in the action, right? And the, your intuition is not formed any other way. And so, what I have done, what, what I did in the past is I actually made, I was best friends with the, with the financial department in my company. I would dedicate entire afternoons to, I would, get, I would get everything taken care of in the field and then I would go back to the main office. We had two separate, two separate offices. We had a corporate office and we had like an engineering and operations office. And I would go to the, to the main office and I would just work through my, my finance, my, my uh, accounts payable information. And then anything that I had questions about or I felt like they didn't understand, I would just go in and talk with them about it. And over time, that tremendously improved their understanding of my operations. And that also had a, the net effect of improving uh, and, and making my operations more efficient because I wasn't having to correct them as often. So really opening up dialogue between people that aren't able to get that kind of uh, that kind of intuitive experience or uh, I'm sorry get the experience necessary to inform their their intuition I think is super helpful um, otherwise I mean there's no substitute for action itself but at least like a conversation is a is a is a great second how about that does that answer your question yeah yeah kind of sort of it's yeah it's super difficult yeah um, so anyway, if you take nothing else away from it, it's just that you need to budget on the front end and then you need to analyze your finances on the back end and you need them both together. Um, so that's the, that's the presentation. Do you guys have any questions? So what is the biggest like, um, tool you just showed us that you use now, for example, at first when you have a meeting with like a new client, you help with like business coaching. With a new client. Yeah, yeah so for example, you go to coach me. Yeah, the, it's the, uh, when, whenever I'm engaged in personnel or leadership stuff, it's the there here path. And trying to figure out what current reality is for my for my client is the, the most important thing. I don't take any other, I don't take any any action until I understand where they're at. And that means that I just ask a ton of questions. Yeah. yeah. So you need to ask the question, what was it again? It was really, what are we missing? But are there other good questions what like entrepreneurs here sitting themselves, they can ask themselves? Ooh. What am I missing myself? So for example, when you have your own business, I don't yeah. have any other questions you recommend asking yourself. Like what am I doing on this planet? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that I think that any entrepreneur has a gut sense of where their problem points are in their business. And so then the question would be, and maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, a lot of people are not fully honest about to 
themselves because they lie to themselves. Right. So what, is a good, what would you frame as a good question? To well, that would be the question is like, where are you lying to yourself? Where are you actually, where are you kind of, where are you kind of pushing the dust off in the corner because you don't actually want to clean the floor completely? Like, that's, that's where, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's for everyone. Like, I do that myself. Like, I've, I, I, yeah. I've noticed that I, when, I'm, when I've been here in Mexico, I've, I've slacked on my financial analysis for my, for my business. I've only, done it, I've only done it twice since I've been here, and I've been here for five months. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a constant battle. We're, we're always like covering up something that we're not doing very well. <laughs> Han, you had a question. Yeah, your biggest, um, like, can, can you give an example of a huge, terrible, like uh, a project that went terribly wrong and that you later thought, you know, I need a tool for you and to, to do this in a better way. Okay, a, a project that went terribly wrong. And why? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I spent way too much money Cleaning up contamination. Uh, we had a we had a facility that had that had um, layers and layers and layers of contamination that had that had built up over the years. Great presentation. Thank you. Great appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, and I spent way too much money on that, and then was uh, publicly like humiliated in in front of the in front of the company because of how much money I spent. Um, in retrospect. I should have spent it differently. I'm not, I'm not, I don't apologize for cleaning up the contamination, but I definitely could have been more responsible with the company's resources and, and getting called out publicly was a huge wake up call. It was like, so was there a budget missing or was there? A yeah, that, yeah, exactly. So I didn't employ my tool here. I, I didn't employ the budget on the front end. I, I kind of got approximate costs and then and launch the project because I'm like, this is so important. We've got to clean up this contamination, right? And then I didn't, I didn't set checkpoints along the way. I didn't, uh, and then I allowed, I, I basically allowed, what, what happens typically is most projects go about 20% over budget and over time. And so that was what happened, except if we exceeded by a lot more than 20%. And so I just allowed it to keep going and keep going. And, we accomplished it, but at what cost? It was so expensive. So, yeah. It's a good lesson, though. I, I was, man, I took that one on the chin <laughs> in a company wide meeting. Oh, man, it was rough. Yeah. Uh huh. I'll tell, I, I'll, I don't want to end on that one because that was, uh, that was a negative. So, I'll give you an example of where cost benefit, where we did employ the tools correctly, and it and it had it was a, an amazing outcome. So, um, I actually don't have the slide here, and I wish I did. So we had a um, we had a processing facility. A vessel exploded. I I, I showed Matilda this, and uh, yesterday I showed a picture. A processing vessel exploded, um, and almost actually seriously injured one of our guys. that exploded right behind him. He took one step and. The entire thing exploded, and uh, and when when things explode on an oil and gas processing facility, you're talking about pressures, you're talking about things that weigh 5,000 kilos, you're talking about pipe that you know is is like 20 meters long that goes flying through the air, like it's super dangerous, and it just creates an enormous mess. So we did first of all, we did root cause analysis. What actually failed? Because we're dealing with pressures all the time. We could have just said, oh, actually, we just pressured up this vessel too much and the vessel failed. But we didn't. We, we actually hired an external investigator because of how serious this was, because of the, of the environmental damage, because of the personnel, because of how, how close we had just come. It's called a near miss. How close we had just come to seriously injuring or, or killing one of, our per, uh, one of our team members. And then also just the extent of the damage. And so we hired a, an external investigator and they, they did a, a, an investigation and we, we, found, we, found on, we found that there was a section of the vessel that we had had manufactured for us where the manufacturer had taken a shortcut. And they had taken one eighth of an inch, they had used a, a sheet of metal that was one eighth of an inch thinner than, than what we had specified. 
And that was that one area was where the vessel had, had cracked and, and then exploded. And what we then realized was, oh shoot, we have these vessels on, a, on three other facilities. We need to go and immediately inspect. So we did, we like immediately, like we're on the phone with the operators out in the field. Hey, can you check this? Hey, can you send us pictures of this? Sure enough, we find more, more bulging in these, in these vessels on other facilities. And so then we made, and these facilities, just to put this in perspective, these facilities were making $100,000 a day for us. $100,000 a day gross. And so we had to, number one, we had to make the hard call and shut down operations, right? Because it's not, we, we don't want this to happen again. So we, we, we just take it on the chin. We're not going, we're gonna lose $100,000 a day because our, our personnel, the safety of our personnel is, is more important. Safety of the environment, we, we don't wanna explode anything else. And so we shut it down. And then we did the cost benefit analysis of, okay, what is it gonna cost us to get all these vessels replaced? And then that, that was directed to me because they're like, all right, Martin, you're the one that's gonna oversee all of this. It's your teams, it's your contractors, you have to, be the, you have to figure this out. Well, let me tell you what, when, you have, when you're missing $100,000 of, of, uh, of revenue, there's a lot of wiggle room for you to, for you to bring in equipment and, and, uh, and teams and all this stuff. But it was worth it in the end. And so long story short, we had the explosion on a Monday and by Friday, we had replaced all of those vessels with, with new stuff from, uh, from a different part of the state. And, uh, and my, my teams worked from sun up to sundown. I was bringing them like, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I was making sure like whatever you guys want, like we're gonna, we're gonna take care of this. And uh, so I'm really proud of that, uh, of that because we did so safely. And I'm, uh, these vessels, I, I, can't, I can't stress how enormous this stuff is. Like we're lifting these, these vessels out of, uh, you know, out of these areas. They're suspended up in the air. We have personnel everywhere. We're using heavy, heavy duty cranes and semis and all this stuff. And we did it all flawlessly. And, uh, and got everything back online within a week. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an example of you using root cause analysis, using that cost benefit analysis and, and, and those leadership principles, making sure that my, my biggest concern as we were doing all of, the, all of this stuff was making sure that my guys were okay because we, had, we, we were under so much pressure and we were, the, the task that was before us was so big, it was so complicated that it would that I didn't want any of my guys hurt, and so that was my that was almost my full time job was just making sure that everything that my guys were set up for success. So that's a positive example to end on that one. But any any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So what is the awesome presentation, by the way? Say Thank you. That's really helpful. But the, what is the biggest lesson you learned from? maybe managing all the stress because there's a lot of things coming at you. But mm. You have a team, like maybe 60 people running, yeah. managing all those people. So there's a lot of, lot of stress coming at you. Yeah. Did you have some new coping, coping mechanisms that you developed while running this kind of businesses that you can use now when you're in Mexico or like developing a new business? Yeah, I mean, uh, that I can use now. Yeah, private, private. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, how I coped at the time, I, I would like to believe that I was like some sort of Superman. I'm not. I just, I had a really good team around me. The guys, like, I, I'm not kidding. The, the, the guys that I, that I worked with, they were, they, were all, they were all Hispanic. They all spoke both Spanish and English. And we were just, I think we all really respected each other. And I, I just, I relied on them. Like, I trusted them. And they trusted me. And we were just a great team. Like, I, I don't, I'm not some Superman. I just really, yeah, I, I, was, I was really blessed. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I will say this. It's not that everything was perfect for me. I had one supervisor that, that I had that was, he, he, he repeatedly let things slip through the cracks. And so I had to have difficult conversations with this guy, which was a, uh, awkward for me. Because here I am in my, I was in my late 20s. And I'm having a conversation with a gentleman who's, who, he could almost be my father's age. And I'm having to hold him accountable for mistakes that he's made. But 
fortunately, I, I did so in a way like I, I just tried to approach it. How can I how can I hold him accountable, but also set him up for success? And so, even in that con this is just a simple example, but in that conversation where I both held him to account and I, and I let him know the seriousness of, of the situation. I also had gone out to the store and purchased him like a leather bound notebook. And I'm like, here, like, please don't ever forget anything again. Here's the nicest notebook I could find in town, write everything down. And, uh, and that, that changed things. It was that gesture of like, hey, you're accountable for your actions. And also I care enough about you to give you a present about it, to keep you accountable. So I'm not Superman, I just had a great team. Um, that didn't. No, 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 no. But yeah. Yeah. Um, mentioned Jocko. Uh, are there any other? I know that you were in film pair too. Were there any yeah. other tools or uh, references that you found really helpful for business advice Ooh. outside of Jocko? Oh outside man. Jocko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually, all right. That's a good question. I actually don't think that the that the military is a very good example for for the corporate world. Um, People use it all the time. Yeah, they 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 use it all the time. It's pretty sexy, right? Um, but people generally speaking don't understand number one how the military works, and then the people that are from the military don't tell how it works. Um, they're kind of dishonest about that. Um, and then uh, they're they're trying to accomplish two different things. Um, military is trying to play a finite game, right? You're trying to win a battle or you're trying to win a war within an infinite space uh, of geopolitics. But the military is all about seeking out, I can tell you, seek out and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver. That's the job of the military. Uh, business is an infinite game. You never win business. There's always gonna be another competitor that pops up. As soon as you resign, someone else is gonna backfill you. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different space. And so to use the, you, great leadership is, is great leadership in any space. That's what I would say. The models from the military, I'm not sure are, are as helpful as people give them credit for, but that's just my opinion. So, yeah. What references would you, oh, sorry. Would you uh, recommend that aside from the military space? Aside from the military space? Um, man, there's, um, that's a great book. Oh. Uh, Chris Voss's book on negotiation. Yeah, negotiating as if your life depends on it. Something to that effect. That is a fantastic book because he talks about the, here he is, you know, former lead uh, um, hostage negotiator for the FBI. And yet he talks about the power of empathy, like the ability to, I, and he says this in, a, in his podcast with Shane Parrish. He's like, I'm genuinely curious why you're crazy, right? Like, I love that. I love that line of, of trying so hard to understand, even if that person is like on its face, objectively crazy or like doing something that we could not even conceive of doing. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a really helpful book. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming out.